chapter 2, verse 12 through 14. It says, I'm, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. We talked about that last week, um, about the spiritual maturity, the levels of spiritual maturity. And this first one is children. And so he says, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. That's, 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 the, that's how you become a child of God, is by having your sins forgiven um, through the name of Jesus. In verse 13, he says, I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. Going on to verse 14, I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. Notice that's the same, the exact same words that he just said concerning fathers. And then finally, he says, I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So over the next few weeks, we're in a new sermon series based here uh, in the book of First John talking about spiritual maturity we're calling it level up so we believe it's god's will for you and for me for all of us to level up to grow in our faith to grow in our christian maturity and christian maturity is not measured the same way that other types of maturity is measured it's not measured in the same uh, way that society measures maturity it's not measured in the same way that religion measures maturity instead john measures spiritual maturity by uh, the ability to know God. And so your level of knowledge of God, and it's not just head knowledge, uh, but it is truly knowing God that is spiritual maturity. Uh, no matter what level you're at, whether a child or a young man or a father. And by the way, John's using the male gender in all of these, not because he's against women, um, but because in those days, uh, women had a lower uh, socioeconomic status than men. And so to say that uh, we are, um, you know, mothers or young women, uh, some, some of us would, would classify that in terms of our gender. But in the spiritual realm, uh, fathers and young men, um, they, they, are, they have the authority, and that's what John is saying here. So he's, he's saying that we are either children, young men, or fathers in the faith. And so if you're not a child of God, that's the first level up that you need to do. You need, first of all, you need to go back and listen to last week's message where I preached from my living room in front of my fake fire um, about uh, becoming a child of God. Uh, you can become a child of God through the name of Jesus. You can have your sins forgiven, and you can know the Father. So that's the first step. Um, but now John's moving on to becoming a father, and it's interesting because he jumps from the first step to the third step. And I think that's because he's showing that it's not a levels or hoops that you have to jump through. This is a, a natural process that we grow into. And so there's no pressure. There's no, there's no man-made timeline for this. Um, but for those of you that have been children of God for some time, I do believe that God's calling you to become fathers of the faith or spiritual fathers. And so when I say spiritual fathers, I mean mentors. I mean leaders. Uh, that's why the leadership training is so important, because uh, God's calling people to rise up from just, just simply being fed, which that's what children do. Children are fed, and, and, and become a father. A father feeds others. A father takes care of others. A father takes responsibility for others. So that's what it means to become a spiritual father. And I believe God's calling many people um, to rise up. Wow. Okay, there's a lot of clash, crashing around. Do you, do you hear that? No, it's it's just in my ears. I'm hearing crashing, so I don't know you guys. I don't know what you guys are doing back there on the tech table, but simmer down and become become spiritual fathers. Let's step up. Let's stop just sim simply waiting for somebody to take care of us and do something for us and feed us and change our diaper and get us food and give us handouts and instead become spiritual fathers where we're reaching out and we're taking care of others, and we're blessing others, and we're helping others. And so, <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> okay, can you uh, can you mute yourself? Yeah, go for it. Go. For it. All right. And so, I have a couple of things which are spiritual. Which what what it means to be a spiritual father. Uh, what it means to be a spiritual father. First off, John says, I'm writing to you fathers, spiritual fathers, 
because you have known him who is from the beginning. So the key to becoming a spiritual father is to have known him. Who's him? That's God. And so knowing God is the key to becoming a spiritual father. By the way, this is also the key to becoming a child of God. So no matter what level you are spiritually, it starts with knowing God and it ends with knowing God. And if you've been reading 1 John at all, you know that knowing God is a really big part of what John has to say. Um, he's, he's going to the, 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 the foot of the mountain is knowing God. The pinnacle of the mountain is knowing God. You say, well, how can that be? Well, because God is a person. And so you can know him on different levels and you can know him deeper. And the deeper you know him, <clears throat> the more you know him the more spiritually mature you become. And this is what he says. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you have known him. And that word know, it's uh, from the word gnosis, or um, gnost that's where we get Gnosticism from, or knowledgeism. And that's one of the things he's fighting against. Um, because the Gnostics would say, hey, uh, the key to spiritual maturity is to know about God, or is to have proper theology, or to know about angels, or to have special secret a hidden knowledge, spiritual knowledge. And John says, no, it's not any special secret knowledge. It's knowledge of God. And it's not just knowledge about God, but it's actually knowing God. So this word is also used in Scripture um, to talk about— i got to be careful. I guess we're online here. I keep it G-rated. But uh, let's see. The Bible says that Adam knew Eve, and then Eve gave birth to their firstborn son. Okay, so it's also used for intimacy. So this idea of knowledge is not just uh, that I know you or I know your name or I know about you, but it's also it also can be used in terms of intimacy that people, uh, husband and wives, can know each other. And, and and I believe this is what John's talking about. A spiritual fatherhood comes out of intimacy with God. It has to be intimacy with God. Anyone who desires to be a spiritual father. Uh, or a spiritual leader, um, based on anything else other than out of their intimacy with God, they they they're never able to actually have spiritual children. So uh, I've been in ministry for long enough, and I've seen many people come through uh, church, uh, our church, other churches that I've been a part of, other ministries that I've been a part of, and it, without fail, people who who desire to be in leadership. Like I, I've heard people even say, "Well, this is this is my next step in my." in my personal growth process is to lead this ministry or to preach or to be a part of this leadership thing. And, and it's interesting because I've always just been like, well, <laughs> people are not a part of your growth process. Uh, leading people, that's not a part of your growth, personal growth process. If you are, if you're seeking to be in charge because you think it's going to improve your life or make you a more complete person, or somehow you're going to get affirmation from from, from from people based on your leadership and based on your ability to, 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 to be a father to them and to take care of them. You're doing it for the wrong reasons, and so you never actually have children. You become an illegitimate spiritual father. But legitimate spiritual fathers, they become fathers out of spiritual intimacy with God. And by the way, that's how it works in the spirit. That's also how it works in the physical. Okay, you become a father through intimacy with your wife, and God created it that way. God set up the physical world that way because that's the way the spiritual world works, because that's the way he works. He could have created this differently. We have chickens on our farm. I'm not, I don't work with the chickens, so I don't really know a whole lot. Ro might know a little more, but uh, we have chickens on our farm, and what I do know is that chickens lay eggs. Like the girl chickens, they're, they're going to lay eggs. And so they've been laying eggs for us, and so that's great. We get protein. But apparently, if a rooster happens to be around, like I don't even th – like I think it's just proximity. They don't even necessarily have to have intimacy if the, if the rooster is around to sit on the egg. Then the egg becomes more than just an egg, and it becomes a chick, like a little chick starts growing inside of it. God could have created us that way, right? I mean, God could have created me to where I don't have to be close to Ro or to know Ro. I can just sit on an egg, and that'll be my contribution. But that's not the way it works. God set it up so that fathers become fathers through intimacy because that's how God works, because that's how we became. I mean, how do you think this whole world was created? This whole world was created out of intimacy. 
that the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were in such beautiful communion with each other, such joyful abandonment, uh, such contentment, that it was out of that that they created the world. It was out of that that he created the world, I should say. Uh, there's, this, there's this interesting passage in Proverbs, and uh, they don't have it on the screen, but uh, let me see. I, 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 I'll see if I can pull it up here. I think it's Proverbs chapter 8. And it's wisdom, which Jesus is the wisdom of God, and it's wisdom personified. And wisdom is talking about the very beginning of the world. And uh, he says here in verse 22, The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works uh, before his deeds of old. It means the Lord revealed me. I was formed long ages ago at the very beginning when the world came to be. And I believe this is talking about Jesus because he was the lamb who was slain from the foundations of of the world and he wasn't created by god he is uncreated he's equal with god but he was there with god in the beginning and he says in verse 24 when there were no watery depths i was brought forth when there were no springs overflowing with water before the mountains were settled in place before the hills i was brought forth before he made the world or its fields or any of the dust of the earth i was there when he set the heavens in place when he marked out the the horizon on the face of the deep when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the foundations uh, of the water below when he gave the sea its boundaries so the waters would not overlap its command when he marked out the foundations of the world he says then I was constantly at his side and he says I was filled with delight day after day always rejoicing in his presence and rejoicing in the world that he had made I love that because that tells me that the world was created out of joy. <laughs> the world was created out of intimacy. The world was created out of laughter. The world was created out of spontaneity. That you and I long for these things because we came from these things. We came from a place of intimacy. We were formed. This entire world was formed by all the beauty that we see. The several shades of red and green and blue and and the bizarre animals and giraffes and uh, butterflies, these were all formed and invented out of intimacy. God didn't create us because he was bored, because he, he was lonely, because he needed somebody to talk to. No, we were birthed out of an overflow of intimacy, which is what God designed in the human family. Uh, for those of you who feel like something's missing in your marriage, do not decide to have a kid because the kid is not what's missing, okay? <laughs> you figure out what's missing, and then you bring a child into a place of wholeness and completeness and joy so that you don't start asking something from them the minute they're born. <laughs> That's a whole other sermon. But the, the natural process is that out of an overflow of intimacy, children come forth. And the same is true with the calling of God to be a father or to be a shepherd, I should say, or to be a, a mentor or to be a helper or to be somebody who inputs into others. The le that level of spiritual maturity requires a greater level of intimacy with God, that when we get close to God, that out of that intimacy comes this fruit, comes this birth. And that's what Jesus told his disciples at the end of his ministry with them. He said, I want you to go into all the world and make disciples. Now, he didn't tell them that in the beginning uh, because they weren't ready for that in the beginning. They were still wanting to be disciples. But at the, end of their, at the end of his ministry, he said, now it's your turn to go and to make disciples. And that's what spiritual fatherhood is. And I believe God's calling some of us. I believe God's calling some of you to rise up from just simply uh, being fed to actually feeding, from simply being led to actually leading. Uh, that God's calling you. You've been sitting in that same seat in that same church for five years. God's calling you to rise up and use some of the stuff that he's been doing in you and to allow him to bring you so close to him that you catch a burden for others, that you see others the way that he sees them. It's out of that intimacy that true leadership comes. Any other leadership, any other attempt at spiritual fatherhood, uh, for any other reason is always it's gonna it's gonna be from a selfish motive It's gonna be from a heart that wants validation. It's gonna be from from a heart that wants somebody uh, To see them in a certain way or in a certain light, but when it flows out of intimacy It always it, it, it always is pure 
And so the first step uh, is to have known God. All right. And the second step, he says, I'm writing to you fathers because you have known um, the one who is from the beginning. So my first step is that you will know the one who is from the beginning. And my second step is that you have known the one who is from the beginning. It sounds like the same step, but it's different. I have to point out the fact that this is the past tense. He says, I'm writing to you, fathers, because you have in the past known him who is from the beginning. And uh, in English, we have basically three tenses. You have past, present, and future. But in the language that this was written in New Testament Greek or in Koine Greek, there are multiple ways of expressing um, the past tense, the present tense, and the future tense. All right, it's not it's not as it's not as one dimensional as English is, and so this tense of this word to have known him, this is in what is called the perfect tense, and so the perfect tense, uh, it's not perfect because it has no flaws. It's a perfect tense because basically it means that it is past tense with present results. The emphasis, though, is not on the past um, action. The emphasis is on the present results. Um, there's another passage where Jesus said, "You have uh, it, it, it is written and it stands written. That's the English way of trying to communicate the perfect tense. Technically, in the Greek, he just said, it has been written. But the emphasis was not on the fact that it had been written. The emphasis was on the fact that it still remains written to this day. And this is true uh, in this passage. He says, I'm writing to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. It's past tense. That there was in the in the past, you had this experience with God, you had intimacy with God, but the emphasis is not on the past experience. The emphasis is not on the baptism or the time you said that prayer or that moment of worship where you felt Him or the time that you were praying or the 21 days where you fasted and prayed. The emphasis is not on the past experience. The emphasis is on the present results, that there was past encounters with God, but that those past encounters produced present continuing results so for some of us if we're going to become spiritual fathers we're going to have to have some fruit that lasts a little longer than a week you know what i'm saying like like if, if you're going to step up if you're going to level up this year you're going to need to actually not just go from experience to experience you're going to have to have an encounter with god but then have lasting fruit that remains after that encounter I'm concerned that a lot of uh, Christians are simply uh, living off of encounters, and yet they are not growing through those encounters. They are not living from those encounters. There is no present results to their past encounters. Instead, they always need new encounters. But to become a spiritual father means that you can live off of an old encounter that you can have an old encounter and still have present results, that, that God doesn't have to you know, blow your mind every five minutes, that God doesn't have to rapture you in, 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 in emotional breakdowns in the middle of the highway as you're driving down the road all, every week, that you don't have to have amazing worship <laughs> at church every week or a great preacher every Sunday, that God, that there is enough in, in what God has done in you to carry you that you can have past intimacy with God and present results, that what you have gone through, it's not just what you've, it's not just what the experiences that you've had, but it is what you've been able to take away from the experiences that you've had. I know people have far less experiences with God and yet have grown far greater with God because of what they've been able to take away from those experiences. The fruit that remains is what's important here. He said, look, I'm writing to you, fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning and you still know him who is from the beginning i'm writing to you because you have had intimacy with god and that intimacy remains and this by the way this is this is john he's the oldest living apostle at the time of this writing he's 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 an old man and he's actually really old uh this is uh, most scholars put put the book of first john at about they date the book at about 95 to 110 AD 95 to 110 AD think about that for a second Jesus went up to heaven at the end of his ministry at around 33 AD uh, that means this book was written somewhere between 62 years after Jesus left the earth remember John was a disciple of Jesus John would have been around a teenager at the time that he was a disciple this is written between 62 and I don't know 
pro this uh, a pretty average estimate it's about 75 years after jesus left the earth 75 years we're talking 75 years that's like world war ii like like just to put that in modern con modern context do you know do you personally know anyone uh who who fought in world war ii now i know there are some of those people still alive i don't personally know somebody who's still alive who fought in world war ii i don't think i do uh that's mighty old john is that old and john is writing and he's saying, Father, I'm writing to you, fathers, because you have had these experiences in the past, and those experiences have carried on into the present. And let me tell you, he knows a little something about past experiences carrying on into the present. Seventy-five years. He is writing, and he says, look, I had this encounter with Jesus, and it's lasted seventy-five years. And he's still mentoring people, and he's still walking with people, and he's been through so much. He's been through so much. And, and, and some of us, especially after a week like this with Snowmageddon, feel like we've been through so much. I, I'm so tired of hearing people say that. I'm really tired of everybody talking about it, as if the entire nation isn't talking about Texas right now. We also have to be complaining about ourselves. We've been through so much. Uh, look, look at, at some point, it's not what you go through in life that counts. It's what you grow through that counts. Because many people go through so much, but they don't grow through it. And so my question is not what did you go through this week? I still don't have water at my house. You have water. Oh, no. we, can, we, can, we can talk about boiling snow and all that kind of stuff. And, 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 it's, and it's fun. But at some point, what did you learn from this week? How, did, did you come to rely more on the faithfulness of God? Did you come to believe more in the provision of God? Did you come to see the hand of God? Did this week make you more generous? Did this week make you more faithful? Did this week make you more loving? If it didn't, then you wasted the week. All you did was sit on the couch, huddled up, and you survived. But that's what children do. Children survive. But if we're going to level up, man, we got to become fathers. we got to become fathers in the faith where we actually grow through what we go through, where we actually learn. And I don't mean just mental lessons. I mean we come to see and know God. You don't just know God in church. You don't just know God from a, a song. You don't just know God from a sermon. You know God when you walk through the valley with him. You know God when you see his hand and his faithfulness in your life. You, these are ways that he reveals himself to you, much more sometimes than even at church. So these encounters, these experiences that I'm talking about, it's not just always at an altar. It's not just always with your hands lifted up and singing elevation songs. Sometimes it's, it's, it's going through weeks like this. Sometimes it's losing your job. Sometimes it's going through a divorce. Sometimes it's dealing with serious issues in life, and you see that God hasn't left you. And John went through some stuff. Uh, uh, Polycarp, one of the early church fathers, talked about John and his life and how John was living in Jerusalem, actually, until Jerusalem was sacked in 70 A.D. And then John, it's, it's said or believed that John escaped Jerusalem and moved to Ephesus. Which that's interesting because you know who the who the bishop of Ephesus was in 70 AD? A young man named Timothy. And Timothy had been mentored by Paul. Paul was Timothy's spiritual father, like what John's talking about here. And yet Paul was killed just a couple of short years before John would have moved to Ephesus. And so it's amazing to me that 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 Timothy loses one father and he gains another. Uh, historically speaking, it's so interesting. And this is like years ago, by the way. This is like 30 years before this was written. John is, is I believe, continuing to mentor Timothy. Isn't that, isn't that crazy to think about? And through all of the temptations and all of the trials, John was, John was boiled alive, by the way. Like in, in, in his older age, he was lowered into boiling oil to be tortured for preaching the gospel, for mentoring pastors, for uh, uh, ministering to churches, for building the church. He was lowered into boiling oil so that he would stop, but he didn't stop. He's lowered into boiling oil, and then he was delivered. Uh, he was pulled out with all these second- and third-degree burns all over his body, and he was taken to an island where they had cut down all of the trees in the middle of the, of the Mediterranean. They cut down all the trees so there was no shade, and he was left 
to burn uh, the, the the burns in his body would continue to be scolded by the sun. John's been through some stuff. John knows what it is to have his faith tested. And he's saying, look, through it all, I grew in it all, and I came to know that he is all in all. I came to know him. And so this is what this is what a spiritual father does. He doesn't it's not that God saves you from going through stuff, but you go through stuff and then you grow through stuff. And you get closer to him and you know him who is from the beginning. He says, you have known him and you still know him. Uh, my third point uh, has to do uh, with the spiritual father will lead uh, people to him who is from the beginning. So a spiritual father knows him who is from the beginning. A spiritual father has known him who is from the beginning. And a spiritual father will lead others to know him who is from the beginning. True spiritual fatherhood is not where you lead people to become dependent on you. Is not where you lead people to fall in love with your personality or your preaching or your anointing. And when I say father, I mean men and women, right? Because uh, she may be a good prophet, but she might not be a spiritual father. She might have an anointing for prayer or for singing, but she might not be a spiritual father. Uh, he might he might have a, a gift of teaching and of administration, but he might not be a spiritual father. There are people who have gifts and anointings and callings and, and capabilities, but they have not yet reached the spiritual maturity level to become a spiritual father. One of the reasons is because they don't point people, they don't lead people, to intimacy with God, primarily because they themselves don't have intimacy with God. And this is, this is the circle. Spiritual fatherhood starts with intimacy with God, and it ends with us leading others to the same intimacy that we have with God. So we know him who is from the beginning, and our job is to help others know him who is from the beginning so that they can know him who is from the beginning so that they can help others know him who is from the beginning. And this is the cycle. This is why I really believe that City Chapel is not meant to be just a church full of children with one father who kind of helps everybody. No, I, my job is to raise up other fathers is to raise up other people who can reproduce and who can serve and who can look after the needs of others and who can know him and continue to know him who is from the beginning and can lead others to him. And so uh, just, just, just recently I was talking with somebody about this very concept because they, they, they were, they've been serving in ministry so, for so long. And yet it's like you can still get, you can still get it twisted a little bit. Uh, you can start to feel like, well, I have this position, and this is my authority, and people ought to respect me. And uh, That's not what spiritual fatherhood is about. It's not looking for respect or looking for a position or looking for affirmation. Instead, John says in 3 John, uh, which maybe we'll get to someday, he says in 3 John, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. No greater joy. That's the role of a father. Eventually, a father is preparing his children to do life without him. Eventually, a father is training his children to do life without him, that they don't come to rely on him, that they don't come to need him, that they don't come to have to check in with him about every little thing. And it's like, well, is this okay? And is that okay? And should I think that? And because, because a true father will never say, I am the source of all truth. A true father will never say, "Hey, don't, 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 don't listen to those guys on the radio, and don't watch that, and don't, you know, you only listen to my stuff." That's not a true father. A true father knows that he's not the only source of truth because he came out of intimacy with God. God is the source of truth, and so a true father will always lead you into intimacy with God, not with himself. And that's what John said. I have no greater joy than to know than to hear that my children are walking on their own. They're walking in the truth. Without my help, I'm not holding their hand. I'm not feeding them. I'm not changing their diaper. My children are walking in the truth. Who's the truth? Jesus is the truth. They're walking with Jesus. They're walking in Jesus. They're, they're mentoring other people. They're discipling other people. John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that. It's, it, 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 be careful if your greatest joy is when you are needed. That's not fatherhood. Once again, that's childhood. 
And so I believe that God's calling us to mature, to grow up, to level up to a place where we don't need to be needed, but rather we need to lead others to the only one who ought to be needed, which is Jesus, the only one who ought to be dependent on, the only one we ought to be leaning on. And um, John, in his gospel, uh, shares an interesting story. I just want to finish with this story right here because it really is. Our journey is from intimacy with God to intimacy with God. Uh, A father births spiritual children, as it were, out of intimacy with God. And then he raises those children to go into a place of intimacy with God. And that's the that's the circle. And there's this beautiful passage in uh, John's Gospel, chapter three. And uh, my iPad just died. So uh, I don't think I don't. If you guys you guys have it on the screen, um, I'm trying to think of another way that I can I can view it somehow. Uh, all right, we'll, we'll see if we can figure this out. Working the the tech tech table at the Fleming House. Um, well, there's this beautiful passage in John chapter three. Hope I'll, I'll be able to get to read it. But it's really interesting because it happens during a period of time when John. Uh, John, John's gospel is is different. I love John's gospel because it's it's he sets up the story of Jesus differently than every other gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all start their gospel with Jesus because Jesus is the central figure of the story, right? But in John's gospel, John actually starts with the very beginning. John chapter one, verse one says, "In the beginning was the Word." That's Jesus. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And he begins unpacking who Jesus really is, not his earthly ministry, but his his, 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 his actual identity. And he begins unpacking that. And then when he starts with Jesus' earthly ministry, he doesn't even start with Jesus. He starts with another guy named John. And so in John's gospel, John starts with a guy named John. Not to confuse you, but uh, John the Baptist is who John starts with. And because John sees John the Baptist's role as being very crucial to Jesus' role, and so and so he follows along the story of John the Baptist. And along John's gospel, you see time and time again he keeps referencing um, John the Baptist and his story. And there's an interesting part of this story in John chapter 3 where uh, – uh, no, it's okay, Barry. I think I, I was able to bring it up here. Where in John chapter 3 where John's ministry, John the Baptist's ministry, is kind of going downhill. It's not doing so good, uh, mainly because people are going after um, Jesus, and people are following Jesus. And so a certain number of the Jews start asking John, aren't you concerned about this? Because this is what they would be concerned about. Because when you're not really a spiritual father, you are concerned about people following you. But when you are a spiritual father, you're only concerned with people following Jesus. And so they're concerned. They're like, well, it's kind of like the, everybody's going to that church now, John. And uh, they bring that concern to John. But John's got an interesting way of dealing with that. Uh, he gives them this story. He gives them this story. Which, and, and the story is, is, is only understandable if you understand the context of the story. He gives them the story in, starting in verse 25. But then uh, in verse 30, he really kind of just narrows it right down to the main point, which is a passage you've probably heard before. John says, he must increase and I must decrease. By the way, if you want to become a spiritual father in 2021, uh, here's, here, here's a message for you. He must increase. And that's why we do everything that we do. That's why we, uh, that's why people are worth it, because he must increase. That's why we have our food pantry open, because he must increase. This is why we plant churches in Florida. This is why I'm preaching to you from my living room on Sunday morning, because he must increase. This is the, the heartbeat of every spiritual father, that the one who called me, the one who my soul loves, the one who validates me, the one who is my companion, the one who is my guide, the one who is my God, he must increase, he says, and I must decrease. And that's, the, that's, the, that's a good uh, recipe for spiritual fatherhood. But he, he tells a story, though, to help explain that. And I think this story will help give you a picture of what it means to be a spiritual father and what it means uh, uh, to, to, to operate in that. And to, but it's an interesting story. It's about a Jewish wedding, an ancient Jewish wedding. Uh, this is 2,000 years ago. This is the kind of weddings that they had. Basically, you would have 
uh, a bride and groom, right? And they would exchange vows in a ceremony, a very small ceremony. Only a few people would be present. The best man would usually be present. And John talks about this best man. Now, I think he says friend of the bridegroom, um, but he means base, essentially best man of the groom. So you have the bride, you have the groom, and you have the best man. John is sharing uh, a, an analogy about those three things. Uh, he says basically the bride is the people, the groom is Jesus, the best man is John. All right. So, so, so in, in in our context, the bride is people, the best man is God or Jesus, and the uh, no the the groom is Jesus, and the best man is us spiritual fathers. Anyone who desires to become a spiritual father, you are basically the best man at Jesus's wedding. <laughs> okay, so this is the picture that John draws for you. Now, even in our context, in our modern day context, that starts to uh, reveal some things, starts getting some wheels turning. But in their context, it was very interesting because the best man had a very specific role. The best man was kind of like um, the maid of honor <laughs> nowadays. So the maid of honor is, is in charge of organizing the wedding, getting out all the invitations and helping with all, all of the, that stuff. That's what the best man would do in those days. Um, and the, the way that their weddings were, were set up is a little bit different. You have an intimate ceremony where bride and groom exchange vows. They would be underneath this white, uh, this white canopy that was symbolic. And there's a lot of different symbolisms within the wedding ceremony. And after the vows were exchanged, though, there would be this seven-day-long party. All right? And uh, Jesus went to one of those parties where he turned the water into wine. So there would be this very long party. But, but before the party, after the vows, before the party— a little something had to happen. Uh, I guess, I don't know, we're in the trying to keep it G-rated. There would be a very quick uh, honeymoon, <laughs> like very quick, because it wasn't meant to be incredibly romantic. Uh, essentially, it was meant to prove that the, the girl was, in fact, a virgin, which in those days was super important. And I know sometimes it's difficult to translate in our context with their context, but no, it was very important. I mean, it was it was massively important that she was what she said she was. Um, or maybe to put it in a more Christian way, that uh, she was fully devoted to one husband. There we go. She was fully devoted to him. And, uh, but that was important. And by the way, it was so important that you had basically a money-back guarantee because a husband in those days had to pay for his wife. He had to pay a dowry to the father of the bride, uh, and to the family of the bride. Well, if she wasn't what she said she was, he got his money back, and she, he, he could return her. Uh, he could send her back. It's a 24-hour uh, return policy. And, and, and this, is, this is really important. Um, this is why uh, – so, so socially, you have to understand there was no social contract for women – who had been divorced. This is why, like, um, in Luke's gospel, Luke uh, uh, alludes to this with um, John, uh, no, with uh, Joseph, that Joseph is is betrothed to Mary, um, his wife Mary, and technically they had already um, made the, uh, the the vows to each other, but they, they hadn't consummated the marriage yet, and then he found out that she was with child, and so in the gospel of Luke, he says that, John, uh, that Joseph was a good uh, man, and so he was going to put her away privately. Privately means he wasn't going to bring her out in front of the whole town and say this woman has damaged the goods, which is what you would normally do. And and the reason why that was so awful or so horrible to happen to you if you are a woman is not because of the shame and humiliation. It's because after that, no guy would marry you. And if no guy will marry you, then you will die. Because in those in that in that context, a woman can't get a job. She can't just go to McDonald's and get a job. She's relying on first her father to provide for her, then her husband to provide for her. But if she has no husband, if and if she will have no husband, then when her father dies, there's literally nobody to provide for her, and there's no uh, allocations within the Mosaic law to take care of her. God made provision for the widows, those who had been widowed. Um, that, that, that people were to leave extra food in the field for them and for the foreigner or the stranger in the land. God made provision for them, but not for the divorced woman. This is why uh, Malachi, for instance, talks about uh, uh, husbands divorcing their wives and, and committing bloodshed because that, they are, in a way, sentencing her to death or to starve to death. 
So this is a really big deal. I'm just trying to say this is a massive deal. And even though it's kind of weird for us nowadays to that like, oh, well, send the wife back just because, well, yeah, uh, if she is not what she said that she was, then the husband was allowed to send her back, and this is in many ways a death sentence for her. It's very serious. And so a part of the wedding is the vows. The next part is making sure um, that she is, in fact, what she said that she was. All right, so this could get a little weird for you, but it's, it's just this is just the way that they did it back in the day. Um, they would they would exchange vows, and then the the husband, the, the groom, would go uh, to a bedchamber to a room that he had prepared. And Jesus kind of alludes to this. He says, "I I go to prepare a place for you." And this is what the, the groom would do. He would go prepare a place. I don't know. He'd light some candles, maybe put some flower petals around the floor or something. I don't know. And then the the best man would bring the bride to that room. And, okay, uh, bring her into the door, close the door. The best man would then stand outside the door. I, I, I know this seems weird to our modern culture, but the best man would stand outside the door and wait. The best man was the one who was waiting to hear from the groom verbal uh, confirmation <laughs> that uh, she was, in fact, what she said she was, okay? And, and that was his job. And then when he got the verbal confirmation, then he knew he could get the party started. They would start the party that night. These were these were party party animals. They, they wouldn't wait till the morning. They would start right away. And so the best man's job was to stand outside the door, make sure that the groom is is – is satisfied that the groom is pleased with 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 the bride and then go start the party now if if there's if there's no happiness in the room there's no party afterward okay and so this is an important part of the story so now that i've spent a good amount of time explaining this let's jump into the story and then it'll it'll make more sense to you verse 25 says an argument developed between some of john's disciples and a certain jew over the matter of ceremonial washing which by the way is one of the things that that the jews were heavily concerned about so they came to john said to him rabbi that man who was with you on the other side of the jordan the one who you testified about look he is baptizing and everyone is going to him interesting that they had a dispute about ceremonial washing but when they came to talk to john they really were just like aren't you a little salty that that guy that you promoted is stealing all of your members he says everyone they say everyone is going to him that's obviously not it's a bit of an exaggeration john's still you're arguing with john's actual disciples who are still with him so i don't know but anyway uh he, he's and so to this verse 27 to this john replied a person can only receive what is given them from heaven you yourselves can testify that i said i'm not the messiah Remember, so he's he's he making he's making sure that he knows his place. I'm not God. I'm not the Messiah. I am sent ahead of him. And this verse 29 is so important. He says the bride belongs to the groom. Man, you got to remember that. All you leaders and pastors and church leaders and prayer warriors and bishops and whatever the bride belongs to the groom. Never forget that. Never forget that the bride belongs to the groom. You cannot get so obsessed with making sure that the bride likes you. <laughs> All right? It's not your job to look good for the bride. It's not your job to get compliments from, from the bride. It's not our job to make sure the bride likes our preaching or our singing or our personality or our small groups it's not our job to attract the bride if we are trying to if we're vying for the attention of the bride man we're missing it the bride he says belongs to the groom she doesn't belong to me i'm not looking for her affection i'm not looking for her approval because she doesn't belong to me if i'm trying to get her to be attracted to me <laughs> in my personality in my gifts in my calling in my church in my graphic design in my youth ministry if i'm trying to get them to be attracted to me then i'm missing the whole point he says the bride belongs to the bridegroom the friend he says and this is the the next part of the verse the friend this is the best man who attends to the bridegroom or who serves the bridegroom the, the groom right that's us he waits and listens for the groom and is full of joy 
when he hears the groom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. So let me let me just let me just break it down for you. This is what this is what our job is as spiritual fathers and mothers and mentors and leaders. Our job, we serve the groom. All right, we don't serve the bride. We're not here to make sure she's happy. We're not here to make sure that she likes us. We serve the groom. So our job is to lead the bride to the groom, open the door to intimacy with the groom, and then close it <laughs> and stand outside. Our job is not to get in there and make sure that we're a part of it. Our job is not to make sure that as we're walking along that she likes uh, us and the way that we look and the way that we smell. Our job is not to be attracted to the bride or to try to get the bride to be attracted to us. Our job is to serve the groom, to lead the bride into a place of intimacy with the groom and close the door, get out of that. You don't need, uh, we don't need to be within, we don't need to be between Jesus and people. We don't need to be in that room. We're not called to be in that room. We are called to be outside that room because our job is to lead people into intimacy with God. And when we lead them into that intimate place, then we step aside and we let them enjoy the affirmation that comes from the Father, the blessings that come from the Father, the identity that comes from the Father. And let me tell you something. If you, if, if, if you are a bride of Christ, if you, if you are a, a child of God, then you know how wonderful that intimacy is, right? Well, let me tell you something. There's something even greater than intimacy with God. And that is intimacy with God while I lead others into intimacy with God. One old timer said there's one thing better than going to heaven, and that's bringing somebody with you. And it, and it really is true. There's, it's so much greater. I, I can tell you being a father is so much better than being a child. Uh, when I was a kid, I thought I, I thought it would be so boring to grow up because then you don't play with GI Joe guys anymore, and you don't play video games anymore. You know, you don't. You know, the, the old, uh, the old. I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid, right? Like that whole thing. I thought, man, it would be so boring to be an adult because you don't get to play anymore. But now I realize that actually being an adult is so much better because investing in others and taking care of others and doing something meaningful is actually more fun than playing. <laughs> So I am kind of playing, I guess. I'm having so much joy. He says, look, this joy is fulfilled whenever I hear, when I hear the voice of the groom. I'm not, I don't get joy when I hear the voice of the bride. I mean, I'm glad that, that she likes me, and I'm glad that, that we're friends, and I'm glad that I can help her. But man, I, her relationship needs to be with the groom, and I get my joy out of my relationship with the groom. That when I hear the groom, that when I hear the groom approving, of his bride and i hear the groom speaking destiny over his bride and i hear the then i know the party is starting and so then i can go celebrate and all, honestly being a, a spiritual father is one celebration after another it's celebrating the movement of god the greatness of god the compassion of god the mercy of god the power of god the we see we see him working on a whole nother level. It's one thing to have intimacy with God yourself, but one thing greater than that is to lead others into intimacy with God. And so I believe that God is calling various ones of us to step up, uh, to level up in 2021, level up into a place of spiritual fatherhood where we're not simply wanting to be intimate with God ourselves, but we're, where we're actually wanting to bring others into that intimacy. We're wanting, we're wanting to bring people who are a part of our work. We're wanting to bring people who are a part of our families. We're wanting to bring people who are on our social media feeds. We're wanting to bring people that we meet in the grocery store. We're wanting to bring people that our kids are on the same soccer team with. We're wanting to bring them into an intimacy with God because I know how awesome it is, and I know how validating it is, and I know how fulfilling a, a, a vibrant relationship with God is, but they don't. They're outside the door, but I know the path. I know how to lead them there because I've been there myself. And I can lead them into that room, and I can introduce them to the love of their soul, the lover of their souls, and the love of their life. I can introduce them to real love, to agape love. And I can close the door, and I know that they will be approved of. I can close the door, and I know that they will be accepted. I can close the door, and I know that, 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 that the party is coming. That the joy is 
coming, that there is so much joy on the other side of people getting to meet Jesus and get close to him. And so, Father, I just pray right now, uh, as you have commissioned me and as you have birthed in me and as, as you have placed me under spiritual fathers and as I have been led to you and as I have been uh, uh, drawn to you, Lord, that, that, that others would also rise up here in City Chapel, that you would lay in the heart of others, people who maybe don't feel that they're ready. They I haven't been saved long enough. I haven't been going to, I don't know, enough. I haven't gone to Bible college. None of that is important. The most important thing is that you have intimate, you have known the Father. If you have known Him, if you have known Him who is from the beginning, and if that knowledge and if that those experiences of Him, if you have brought some things away from that, and if that has remained, if that fruit has remained, then all you have need now is simply to lead others to Him. You don't need to teach. You don't need to preach. You don't need to pray uh, powerful prayers. No, no, no. Giftings are not important for fatherhood. Fatherhood is not based on giftings. You can have giftings without fatherhood, actually. <laughs> you don't need giftings for fatherhood. You simply need to have known him who is from the beginning and to lead others into that place. And so, Lord, may we do that. May you raise up people in City Chapel even now. May you call them even now. May you draw them even now. They might not feel qualified. Or and Religion has such a way of messing us up with these qualification rules and roles. And maybe we knew great spiritual fathers and we never will measure up to that. Lord, would you, would you, would you redefine for us? Would you wipe away some of uh, these, these denominational lines and things that we have established in our own mind, traditions of men, really? And let us simply read your word. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. Period. <laughs> and so, Lord, may, as we know you, as we know you deeper, may we draw others into that place. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I love you all. Thank you for joining us.